Greetings, cannabis cultivators worldwide. Jordan River here, back with more Growcast, where it's Crobember every single month. Today we have Dr. Judith Fitzpatrick back on the line, but she's not alone. We also have the great Jeff Lowenfels. Holy crow, the man himself is back. This episode is incredible. It needs no introduction. We'll get into it. Lickety split. Before that, though, we have to give love to Rimrock Analytical. RimrockAnalytical.com, code GROWCAST for free shipping on all your tests. Go ahead and jump in and get a gender identification test. That's where to start. Special thanks to Rimrock for giving us free tests for our Seed Co. members. That's really cool. If you use these tests once, you'll never go back. You have a gender ID test ready to go, so when your seedlings come up and develop the first true set of leaves, you snip the cotyledons, you ship them off to Rimrock, and they will identify the males and the females. Kill the males. You're off to the races. Stop wasting time sexing, cloning, uh, fertilizer space, weeks to get those clones rooted and flipped. You don't need to do any of that. Just use rimrockanalytical.com, code GROWCAST for free shipping, plus check out their soil tests, plant tissue tests, and so much more. Rimrock Analytical. Thank you to Rimrock. All right, let's get right into it, everybody. Can you tell I'm excited? This is a really good one. Thank you all for listening, and enjoy the program. Hello, podcast listeners. You are now listening to Growcast. I'm your host, Jordan River, and I want to thank you for tuning in today. Before we get started, as always, I urge you to share the show. Tell a friend, tell a grower about Growcast. It's the biggest way you can help us out. Hit subscribe so you catch every episode, whatever you're listening to us on, and make sure to check out growcastpodcast.com slash membership for the greatest cannabis cultivation membership. Today, we have back on the line, it's the microbio, I almost said microbiometer. It's the microbiometer team. We have Dr. Judith Fitzpatrick back on the line. How's it going, Judy? Very good, thanks. And also a return guest, uh, we have Jeff Lowenfels himself. How is it going, Jeff? Welcome back to the program. Excellent, excellent. Always good. Oh, man, we appreciate you so much. I mean, in the Discord community chat at Growcast, your work comes up in the resource channel, maybe more than anybody else's work. You know, your teaming series, such a staple. So we're really, really happy to have both of you here today. What a pleasure. Let's do some updates, though. What have you been up to, Jeff? I mean, last time you were on the show was like a year ago, maybe more. What have you been working on? I hear there's a new book in the works. What can you tell us? Yeah, I think last time we were talking, I uh, hung the phone up uh, and uh, started to write a new book. <laughs> so uh, that and that happened. Uh, so there's going to be a new book coming out in early summer, I hope. Could be a little bit middle summer uh, called Teeming with Bacteria. And it is about endophytic bacteria and bacteria that participate in what's known as the rhizophagy, rhizophagy cycle. And I think people are going to find this to be an interesting and a major addition to the soil food web system. Oh, man. We operate the system or we look at the system as operating the bacteria and the fungi get eaten. The resultant poop in the rhizosphere has plant nutrients in it mm -hmm. that are then diffused and moved by mass flow, et cetera, into the roots. What we've now discovered, uh, and in particular, a, a, a bunch of folks at Rutgers University, uh, led by Dr. James White, is that bacteria actually go inside the plant and feed the plant from inside Whoa. as well. And so this is a book that's going to explain a, a whole new section of soil food webism, I guess, if that's the That is wild. Is it, um, I mean, the way you describe yeah. that, it's like this is a previously totally unknown biological process. That's correct. And it is one of the wildest, craziest biological processes I've, I've ever seen. And uh, it, it really is an amazing thing. And one of the great things about it is that these bacteria are the same bacteria that we normally look at around the rhizosphere. And so uh, it, we, we're seeing new functions, et cetera. And, and of course, lots of this can be measured with the microbiome. Oh, yeah, baby. Love, loving everything you guys are doing. Uh, we'll get into you two and, and the work you've done together. Real quick, though, this, this question just springs to mind. Jeff, when someone's looking to get into your series, what order should they read your books in? No question they should start with teaming with microbes. And then I suggest teaming with fungi second and teaming with nutrients third. Love it. Once this bacteria book comes out, 
uh, then it'll be a toss-up between fungi and bacteria. I mean, it really is sort of amazing to, to discover that almost or up to 40% of the nitrogen that a plant uses is produced by bacteria inside the roots. Wow. Not outside, but inside. So, so yeah, this is going to be kind of fun. Super interesting. Bacteria do the same thing that fungi do, only they do it slightly different. Mycorrhizal fungi, as we know, feed the plants. Well, these bacteria do the same thing, slightly different system. Uh, just really quick, we'll throw it out here. Microbiometer.com, code GROWCAST saves you 15% still. And I believe there's an option to like add a couple bucks and you get a book. You get Jeff Lowenfeld's work. Uh, so if you're looking to start and start educating yourself, that's a good way to do it. We also have some more prizes that we'll be teasing later on. Yes, but right now, for $5 extra, we include Jeff's book, Teeming with Microbes. Ah, so it comes with Teeming with Microbes. Perfect. There you go. So there's a way to get yourself a copy for very, very cheap. And like right. I said, we got some other prizes that we'll be teasing down the road. But you two. You too. But I think. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, like, one of the things that Jeff brings up there is, you know, if people are trying to grow organically or at least to cut back on the amount of nitrogen they add, you know, this tells you again how important the microbes are in actually providing the nitrogen to the plant. Mm hmm. So in a sterile system, you're missing out on this process and you're just kind of replacing this whole process with chelated nutrients that are instantly available? Or are, is the microbiology still functioning to a lesser degree? How does that work in like a sterile grow, for instance? Well, if you get a real sterile grow, you know, and, and that's not always easy. Yeah, you don't, you, you won't even get root hairs because it turns out these bacteria that, that are feeding the plant actually cause the plant to form root hairs. Whoa. And if you don't have these bacteria because you've sterilized the system, the roots don't develop properly and they don't get root hairs at all. It's absolutely amazing. This, this is going to be some real eye-opening stuff because oh my God. people just had no idea this was going on and new techniques and microscopy has, has really been the been the the trick here and and this fellow dr james white really knows how to do this stuff it's unbelievable oh and the photographs that 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 he has taken many of which will be in the book are mind-blowing it's just mind-blowing we think plants are just these dumb stationary things and uh they're not they're they're beyond advanced <laughs> right and the video that of jeff and i talking with dr james white is on our youtube under microbiometer you'll find it oh go and check it out everybody i know that a bunch of people are going to go listen to that it was very very popular i mean james white is a really incredible researcher and yeah and very and very brave unbelievable yeah oh. and he's very brave nobody uh, this rhizophasy cycle is engaged by every plant that has root hairs because we now know that these bacteria are what cause the root hairs. And so that means basically every plant you know, clearly cannabis, uh, is, is participating in this cycle and nobody knows about it. I mean, nobody knows about it. The, the, the good doctor has been doing his best to try to get the word out there, but people aren't paying attention. Wow. This is a major way that plants get their food. And then on top of that, a lot of these bacteria or move into the plant in different areas and do other things than, than just feeding them. I mean, they protect them from uh, all sorts of stresses, uh, heat, cold. Uh, they fight it off pathogens. Uh, they jump from the roots onto fungi, uh, farm the fungi, go back into the roots. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable what really occurs down there. And, and you know, Judy and I are always telling people, you have got to have good biomass so that the plant can pick the microbes that it needs. Mm -hmm. And the only way to really know whether you've got a good biomass or the easiest way is to use a microbiometer. I mean, it's just that simple. <laughs> and once again, you know, I, I find myself in a situation talking, talking about something that few people know about uh, mm -hmm. the microbiometer. And once they, once they hear about it, Bing, the light bulb goes on, but it's getting people to understand that this new tool out there does all sorts of amazing things for us, those of us that use the soil food web to grow our, to grow our, our plants. So 
Uh, yeah, it all ties together. It's absolutely amazing. And, and uh, Judy and I have a lot of fun uh, talking about this stuff and talking to other people about it. I absolutely love it, man. We'll be right back with Jeff and Judy. But before that, I'm here to tell you about Growcast membership, baby. Come on in. What are you waiting for? If you've been thinking about joining, there's never been a better time. We got weekly live streams, Growcast TV. It's the greatest show in growing. Uh, Brandon Rust was just on. You got hundreds of hours of bonus content at this point. That's members only. It's at growcastpodcast.com slash membership. That'll bring you right to our Patreon page. And you get access to the member Discord as well, where we will solve all of your problems and you can share your successes. There's so many contests going on in there. We have a grow along going on monthly bud winners. There's a worst of the month. Whoever has the worst plant gets free seeds all for $10 a month. What more could you ask for? Come and give it a try. If you like Growcast, if you want to support what we're doing, and more importantly, if you want to get more and better content, head over to growcastpodcast.com slash membership. What are you waiting for? We would love to see you there, and we're here to lift up other growers and have a lot of fun doing it. So I'll see you in membership, everybody. You will not regret it. All right, let's get back to it with Jeff and Judy. We have so many questions here. I want to talk about, you know, fungal dominance versus bacterial dominance, what this all means to cannabis cultivators, all of that. And I don't, this this isn't just a microbiometer commercial. I am sincerely interested in this stuff and specifically home testing at an affordable level. So while we're here on the subject, just really quickly, what are you using the microbiometer for in your setup? And, And what are the kind of applicable capabilities that a cannabis gardener like myself would be able to engage in? Well, I, I mean, I, speaking for myself, and I think, you know, Judy does probably the same things. I mean, this, it, it, anytime I get any soil, I test it. And then I can test it later on to see whether I am helping that soil become better living soil or whether I am hurting that soil. Okay. And uh, it's so easy to do with this test. You just, it takes five or 10 minutes and you just, you just know uh, whether you're doing the right things for your plants. And you can also do some great experiments. So for example, I always tell people, don't throw your soil away, reuse your soil. Well, using this test, you can see that it, that it makes sense to reuse your soil. Wow. It's just a wonderful system to determine whether you are increasing your, your microbes or whether you're holding them static or whether you're decreasing them. Right. So whatever you may, whether you're, whether you're applying a product like, you know, a bacterial product trying to get more to take, or whether you're testing to see if something you're using is knocking back the biology, those are all really applicable home test scenarios. Right. Compost tea, it works on as well. My understanding. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it works better on soil. I, I, Jude, what, Judy, what do you think? It depends on how you make your compost tea. If you make your compost tea from actual real compost, the way, you know, like a pile in the backyard and, and, or how farmers do it, you know, in rows outside, it's okay because it basically becomes a a form of soil. But what we're picking up is the pigment in the microbes. Right. And some people are, are making, you know, growing, you can grow microbes just on plain sugar and then they have no pigment. Wow. In that case, we don't pick them up. Why is that? I don't, I don't understand that as a lay person. Yeah. So well, what we're saying micro, is, what? you know, if you said you made compost, like some of the amendments that I've looked at, they're basically, they're 90% sugar and then some bacteria. So, I mean, I can see the bacteria under the microscope because I can focus down to see bacteria that don't have any pigment, but they won't show up in our tests. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think what people don't understand is that these bacteria are normally they don't really, they don't have a color and they absorb whatever they're, so if they're in soil, oh. they become soil colored. Oh, wow. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you put a bacterium in blood, it becomes blood colored. Uh, I think I'm right here, Judy, aren't I? I mean, <laughs> uh, and so, so, you know, that. we've got, we've got compost teas that sometimes are, you know, pretty watery and a lot of products are sold that are, you know, pretty clear. They say they've got microbes in it and they may, but it's hard to measure. So what you want to do is use your own living soil, your own living compost. Oh, you know, man. Test it first. Can't beat that old school compost pile is what you're saying. I mean, like you said, it's it's not 
one or the other. But like you said, at least there it's testable, it's quantifiable, and, and you can really play around with it. Right. The microbes don't necessarily take the uh, pigment from the soil color itself. So it's not soil particles that they have in them. But a lot of enzymes have colors and, oh. and different, uh, you know, molecular assemblies within the, within the microbe actually have them. And, you know, I think we talked about that last time that the microbes at different levels in the soil have different colors too. So we recommend, you know, our, our test is validated on the top five inches of soil. And we show that no matter what the color of the soil, we're still measuring the same amount of microbes that we can measure under microscopy. Right. Yeah. And, and I think people need to understand that the number of microbes relates to the nitrogen that you're giving your plant. Other stuff too, but nitrogen is the key. So can you, can you kind of dig down on that relationship? Again, I, that's not something that I'm totally clear on. Well, if you, if you have a lot of microbes, you've got a lot of nitrogen being produced either through the old system. You oh, know, right. Maybe. That's what you were referring to before. I see. I see. So, yeah. so now we know that up to 40%, like you said, is being produced. Okay. That, so that's, that's the big breakthrough that you were referring that's to. That's just internally from the bacteria inside. But the nitrogen in, that goes into your plant from the soil itself is produced by the fungi and the bacteria being eaten by the protozoa and the nematodes. Right. And what results is waste in, in nitrogen plant usable form. And it all correlates to the microbiomass. If you have a high microbiomass, you're going to have good nitrogen. If you have a really low microbiomass, you're not going to have great nitrogen. Jeez. Yeah, because one of the things we've become aware of in the last uh, you know, several years is that there are plenty of microbes in the soil that are capable of fixing atmospheric nitrogen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So th these microbes are cultivated by the plant because the plant puts out foods that they particularly like. So it recruits them to the root area. And so, you know, you have nodules if you're, if you're growing legumes, but they're, the same bacteria that can function within those nodules on legumes can also be free living in the soil and they can be increased by feeding the population. And I, I think another thing that Jeff and I kind of have agreed on is the population in the soil, just increasing the population increases the health because this is a population that's very interdependent. Mm -hmm. Just as we live in a society that's totally interdependent, like, you know, none of us, most of us don't grow our own food. We're relying on other people for our food. Okay. We're relying on society for cleaning up after us. You know, we're, we're relying on outside people for our ability to communicate. This is even more so true for the microbes. So if you're increasing the population, you can only do that if it's a healthy population. And these microbes that have su survived in these communities for almost 4 billion years are extremely good at building a community that's resilient and that can service the plant. Well, and the plant gets involved as well. And so, so it's really an unbelievable relationship. But Judy's right. I mean, there are so many nitrogen fixing capable bacteria that are in the soil doing their thing without being attached to the plant, uh, that scientists are now looking at those bacteria in particular uh, and trying to figure out how do, we, how do we create a situation where we can get them inside the plant where they're, doing their, where they're doing their thing inside the plant. And of course, many of these scientists don't know that a lot of these bacteria are going in the plant through the rhizofasci cycle and providing nitrogen. And as they find out, I think it's going to be a real revolution in terms of trying to get the right bacteria into the roots area uh, so that they'll provide more nitrogen to the plant when they go into the plant. So uh, it's, this rhizofasci stuff, is, it's just, it's fascinating, absolutely fascinating. I think we're going to find, I mean, I think this is an incredible area. I mean, if you compare us, the animals, okay, to, I'm an immunologist, 
to the plant, our whole immune system is dependent on our microbiome. Right. As humans, we have more microbes in us than we have human cells. Mm -hmm. Without those microbes, we don't develop a proper immune response. And I think we're, what we're going to find is the, you know, we've talked about all the time that the microbes are what stimulate the immune system of a plant. And without it, the plant does not develop an adequate immune system. And I'm, I'm sure we're going to find out that it's these microbes that are ingested that are the ones that are doing the biggest job on stimulating the immune system in the plant. Percent. Well, and in fact, we already have because what, what, what the latest discoveries show that, is that these bacteria, and incidentally, they operate almost identically to certain bacteria in your intestines. And so the way they get into the plant requires them to go past a, a cellular barrier that triggers the production of superoxides that try to kill the bacteria that's entering into the plant. Jeez. And the plant has to be able to handle that superoxide itself. It produces that superoxide, but that superoxide has the capability, uh, if it's not handled properly, of destroying the plant cell itself. Wow. And so there's a it's like an autoimmune system disorder or something. It's unbelievable. And so once the plant learns how to handle that oxygen, uh, that that superoxygen in the root system, that immunology, so to speak, transfers throughout the entire plant. And the plant is able to handle all sorts of things that it would not have been able to had these bacteria not triggered uh, this oxide system that tries to destroy the entering bacteria. It's wow. really yeah. amazing. There are so many parallels to, to human health, and that fascinates yeah. me so much. I, I work on the Coffee Health and Science podcast as well, and microbiome comes up all the time. Just in Judith's last interview, we kind of made this connection between the soil microbes and the microbes in our human microbiome and, our, and, and in our gut microbiome and, and everything. It's just infinitely fascinating to me. And all the parallels are truly mind blowing. Well, you know, and, and one of the problems is, of course, we think of it in terms of uh, first, we think of it in terms of ourselves. We're in charge. These are just little things running around. And then we think of them in terms of the plant, uh, which is in charge. <laughs> but these bacterium, for example, are so plentiful and they divide every, you know, they can multiply every 20 minutes. It's, it's unbelievable. I mean, it, to, to think that your mood has anything to do with anything you're doing other than your bacteria <laughs> is crazy. It's you know, true. I mean, it's a, they, <laughs> they rule. And so, so uh, uh, you know, we've got to start thinking about, about how we deal with them in terms of plants. And of course, we don't, we don't learn about them properly either. I yeah. mean, we learn about bacteria when we're in college, maybe, or, you know, you take a grad course or heavy duty, you know, you don't learn about, about them when you're a little kid, you learn about dinosaurs. Yeah. And we really ought to be learning about bacteria because dinosaurs don't do dingo for us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You learn about cumulus clouds and igneous rocks. Yeah. And the microbes <laughs> do. So what I'm hoping someday is, is that Judith comes up with uh, another addition to the, to the microbiometer uh, that'll tell us what kind of bacteria we have down there. I mean, I think we're, you know, what Judith has done with the microbiometer is absolutely, and, and, and the people who work for her, absolutely amazing. The idea that you can turn this little, your phone into a, into a scientific instrument that can measure pH, fungal bacteria, you know, the microbiomass. At some point in time, that little phone's also going to be able to do genetic sampling, uh, you know, think of the things that that you could probably do with a real good lens, and that's what our phones are going to be capable of doing as we go forward. Oh my God! Can we talk about that? What what is that barrier? Because because my, that's my understanding is that uh, the count is incredible. Get, getting the active count and distinguishing between bacteria and fung, fungi is incredible. But then, like you said, what if we could identify the species? Is that what is the barrier to that, and is that a possibility? Maybe Judith or, or whoever well, wants to answer that. DNA, of course, it's DNA. I mean, you got to be able to test. You got to be able to do that. It's going to be and, a DNA test. Yeah, and now what happens is is we've got machines that can do that. I mean, you know, you can send in and have your own DNA tested. Now they have machines that you know about the size of a dishwasher. Uh, it's pretty expensive, but at right. some point in time, that little that system is either going to be 
uh, something that that can be sitting in in uh, Judith's, you know, the microbiometer's office. And when you take a picture on your phone, it'll go through that database in right. Judith's office, and it'll tell you. I don't. I mean, I, of course, Judith is sitting there going, ah, "We've got enough problems as it is." <laughs> no, no, I agree. You know, I think that's where the science will end up at some time. But one of the things we don't know right now is what what species you actually really want. Because, right. well, yeah. because it varies so much from crop to crop and soil to soil. I mean, we're, we're kind of stuck with looking at outcome. Because, you know, one experiment will show, you know, they added this microbe and it really did really well. And then you go to the next, mi- you go to another county or another state and the same system doesn't work again, which is the... The problem that regenerative agriculture is up against. Right. Yeah, I, I, it, it is becoming a little bit easier to, to tell whether you've got a good or bad bacteria for particular situations. And in fact, one of the things I, I struggled with in the book is, you know, since people don't know bacteria and they're all, sci- you know, the scientific names are as complicated as plant scientific names. You know, do, do, should I include them? I mean, I, I, what I was worried about is people pick up the book and, you know, start seeing all this italicized lat, you know, the names of complicated. But what I discovered, I did include them. And what I discovered when I got to the end of the book was, you know, there are about 15 phylum that are really key. And I mean, there's, there's certain ones that you begin to recognize as being really important. And in fact, I once read an article, uh, a study that indicated there were about 518 bacterium that are found in all soils everywhere, you know, the healthy soils. And those are the ones you want to have. And so we're going to be able to key in somehow on these things. It's just going to take a a little while longer. I mean, the fact that Judith's able to tell us, you know, fungal bacteria ratio, uh, you know, that's who thought we could do that? Well, I know we didn't think we could do that when you started, Judith, because I kept bugging you about it. And all of a sudden, <laughs> bingo, you announced that you got it. You know? Yeah, it's funny how things like that work, right? It's just that that tipping point. But yeah. I know from a cannabis right. uh, grower's perspective, especially, let's be honest, what a lot of home growers are doing. Uh, I know, you know, Jeff, you lead this kind of regenerative agriculture movement. And a lot of that stuff takes place outside. It takes place in the field. And a lot of things operate differently outside in the field. You know, uh, the way microbes work, nutrient distribution, pest management, it's all totally different than in my space, which is a a grow tent with, uh, as a recent guest said, not a soil, really more like a modified growing medium, right? It's, it's, it's a bagged super soil that Mm -hmm. I bought. And, um, I would, I would like to be able to distinguish the species because it might be cool to take a look at the different, you know, glomus species and see, oh, wow, the great white really did take to my garden in my situation, my modified growing medium, uh, as opposed to, you know, the other brand of Michael Reiser or whatever it may be. Just as an example, that might be cool to see, like, which species becomes dominant. Well, I think in that particular instance, we know which species is going to be dominant. The question is, is the product that you bought sufficiently populated with propagules that will be able to do that? I mean, so we this, know yeah, that this is something that comes Razo- up a lot. Razophagus intercedes is the one that feeds cannabis. What's your take on myco products? I would love to hear. Well, I, I, there's one I actually endorse. I like it because it's not only got the rhizophasi interacetes, but it's also got a couple of other species uh, that feed your cover crops because people ought to be using cover crops as well. Shout Even it out, indoors, man. I might add. We have no masters here. We want to hear Jeff Lowenfeld's favorite myco brand. Oh, no, I don't think I should do that. I don't, Why? I, I, no, I'm giving I you permission. You. It's my show. You think I... It's my show. Yeah, I'd love to be, have you shout them out. Do you mind? Mm, yeah, I think I'm gonna be. I think I gotta be a little careful about it because I don't. Okay. Want, I don't want to upset some some of, you, some of your listeners. But why? Uh, no, my, oh, the label please. has. All right, that's all right. Tell me off air, and then I'll tell people team, in private. It has the team with microbes uh, label on it, so you can you can. It, it's endorsed, ah, and incidentally, <laughs> I am, I endorse products based upon how they do a, a microbiometer test. In other words, I was always, I would never endorse a product until I knew it had great microbiology and that the microbiology was acting properly. And I never could figure out how to do that until Judith came up with the microbiome. Sure. It's all just personal testing at that point. It's what tells me that things team with micro. I mean, it's just, you know, again, it's not, not, not to be an advertisement. It is a terrific 
system which people really, if you're growing, you need it. You know, you need to know your pH. You also need to know your microbiomass. You just need it. Wow. Uh, fungal bacteria, yeah, that's okay. You know, I mean, and you can use it for various things. It's not as important, I think, as people make it out to be. You know, basically, the longer a plant's in the ground, the more fungal it is. Mm -hmm. And so if you're growing auto-flowering cannabis, you know, a fungal bacteria ratio probably, I don't know. I mean, you know, they grow so quickly. Of course, the second and third time you use your soil, it's got a good fungal bacteria ratio in it. But sure. it's, it, 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 people should be experimenting and they should be seeing. I've got a fungal bacteria ratio of XYZ using the microbiometer. My plant came out terrific. I got one with ZDD and it didn't come out terrific. And, you know, people need to keep records. It's not difficult. And in fact, Judith will keep the records for you, won't you, Judith? <laughs> yep, the, record is, the record is in the... Uh... In the in the cloud, I mean, one thing that is, you know, like if you want to see if your plant is colonized, you can just take a piece of root and then just take the soil that's right around the root and run it in microbiometer, and you'll see the fungi there. Oh. Okay, so you, well, you'll get a you, a, you won't you will you'll, you'll get a high see. fungal to bacterial ratio, yeah, like. Yeah. Um, Anytime around dandelions, because oh. they they harbor a lot of AMF, so you can tell if that happens. So I mean, you should titer actually because you can put down too much AMF, and the AMF now we know does better if it's acclimated to your soil, which is one of the reasons that reusing soil is good because the spores from last year's and, and the microbes that last year's plant or the last plant nurtured are the same ones that are going to help your plant again this this time. Right, right. That makes sense. Yeah, which is key, which is another reason why you don't want to sterilize. People talk about uh, terroir, which, which is not something you could really do, I don't think, with cannabis. Uh, you know, the idea that you grow it in certain soils, it's going to taste a certain way and you grow you know, if you grow it near strawberries, it's going to taste like strawberries. I, I think that does, that doesn't make any scientific sense to me at all. But what does make sense is the fact that these endophytic bacteria that are the subject of this fourth book, these endophytic bacteria move into the plant, move up towards the flower, get into the flower. And then as a seed is formed, they're enveloped inside that seed. And so you've got bacterium that are designed and that have been functioning to make your plant work better. They are passed on to the next generation wow. in that seed. So if you sterilize your soil and sterilize your seeds, which many people do using hydrogen peroxide, you are not going to be getting the microbes that you want or the full set of microbes that you want to grow your plant. There are some experiments where they've taken 400-year-old corn varieties, they have the same bacteria in them today. It's just unbelievable. It's mind-boggling. And again, it's something that we, we need to know about, but we also need to try to measure this stuff. That's what's so great about the microbiometer. <laughs> Information's power. And you got to be able to measure stuff to be able to to use that information. And that's well, what this yeah. is. Otherwise, you're just playing blind, but that is an interesting verification. I've always thought that was a bad idea to use hydrogen peroxide on seeds. I was, it's the same yeah. reason I thought it was a bad idea to have like uh, antimicrobial agents in your cloning gel. Like, don't you want to right, kind of exactly. jumpstart with biology and keep everything going from the, that's kind of like, um, again, Jesus Christ, we're wandering into health territory and we're on Growcast and here I am about to say, that's kind of like vaginal birth. Um, but it's true. If you well, take if you take a look at all of the incredible biological processes that take place in birth and what happens if you don't have that natural birthing process, there are major biological changes and microbial shortcomings. Right. Well, I mean, in this particular instance, there is a a growing body of uh, proof, and Dr. James White and his and his uh, grad students, I think, are really the the major source of this. Is that that the same thing that happens with these bacteria backing into the into the meristem and the root system and, you know, growing and wait till you hear the, the whole system. The same thing happens in trichomes. Hmm. And it very well may be uh, that trichomes in, on cannabis 
are not there to protect the plant from UV, are not there for any other reason but to move bacteria up towards the flower so that they get into the into the seed for the next generation. Jesus. Now, that would be absolutely amazing. Wow. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff going on here that that we as growers you know, need to be paying attention to. But this rhizostophagy cycle and these endophytes are absolutely fascinating. And uh, you're going to be hearing tons of it, even if, even if my book doesn't sell. Uh, this is <laughs> just, just as mycorrhizal fungi. People used to say, mycorrhizal fungi, what are you talking about? They're everywhere. You don't need it. You know, now we know 90% of all plants need the mycorrhizal fungi to be able to thrive. And you can use them. We can lab grow some of them. Uh, you know, the same thing's going to be happening with these bacteria. We're going to learn that they're doing things that we, we didn't think they were doing. It's just, uh, it's unbelievable. So uh, everything you think about a mycorrhizal fungi and how much we've learned over the past 12, 15 years about them, we're going to be, we're going to be learning about these rhizophagy microbes. Man, it's one of my favorite subjects. I, like you, I'm just intrigued infinitely. So let's see here. We have so much more to discuss. One question that I have that I'd like you to drill down on, and hopefully this will send you off and running. You know, I have heard of different ratios, fungal to bacterial ratios, and this is something that you test with your device. Is there an ideal ratio for cannabis? Do we know what, what one dominance does in a beneficial or negative way? And what can you tell me about bacterial to fungal ratios in soil and, and what they mean? Well, uh, Judy, you want me to take a quick shot? Yeah, you can start. The, the concept is this. That if you, when, you, when you start out with, with a sterile system, what happens is the first thing that appear are bacteria. And then plants start to grow, the plants die, and fungi move in to be able to decay and break the plant down. And so when you start at the beach end of the spectrum, you have bacteria. And when you move to the old growth forest end, the other end of the spectrum, you have tremendous amounts of fungi. The bacteria number basically stays the same all the way along. So the ratio changes. And as you, if you're growing an evergreen tree, that means you want to have lots of fungal. So where is a cannabis plant on that spectrum? Is it to the left of the strawberry? Is it to the left of the, of the lawn grass plant? You know, you got to sort of figure it out. And different kinds of cannabis I have a different spot. Right. Favor so different auto ratios. Cannabis, wow. Yeah. How long are they in the soil? The autoflowering cannabis is in the soil very short period of time. The fungi don't have a great period of time to develop a relationship with it. Wow. Whereas, uh, you know, some of these indicas and sativas, they could be in the, in the ground for eight months and they get a great opportunity to develop. God, that's so, a good point. So, so you start out and you know that these are, at, the general rule is that if a plant is in the ground for more than a year, in other words, it's a perennial or a tree or a shrub, it needs a higher fungal than bacterial. And if it's in the ground for less than a year, in general, it likes more bacterial than fungal. Oh, That's well, sort of go. the general rule. Sure. So where exactly is the fungal bacteria ratio? I think part of this controversy may have started because, because I was saying, gee, you know, you really need bacterial for your cannabis plants. And I think Elaine Ingham came in and ran correctly. So I said, nah, you know, <laughs> there's a spot here where the fungal uh, is, a, is a little bit higher. So I don't know the answer, but I know it's not high fungal. And I, I know that you need to have tremendous amounts of bacteria, mm -hmm. but you need fungal as well. Right. You always need fungal. Man, so, so interesting. What do you think, Judy? If we look at um, the data we have from from some of the data that people have put in and we, we know that they're looking at uh, agricultural fields, uh, we, we come up with a, we see that the average is about 0.7, which is what is reported for microscopy. Mm -hmm. If you're using a different system, like people use PLFA, the ratio is like 0.02 to 0.06. That's the general range. Okay. Because they measure such a small amount of the fungi, they don't really have ratios that compare to, you know, what you can visually, like microscopically see or something like that. But it can go quite high if you're actually mm -hmm. looking at the rhizosphere soil of a plant that's very dependent on AMF. And when, when I go out in the field 
and they have used a legume or uh, not a legume, I'm sorry, but they've used clover and the clover's died off. The, the soil is just full of spores. The same if, as if I go into fungal spores, the same as if I go into a, uh, a winery field, you know, I see 10 to 1 fungi to bacteria if I if I go into a grape growing mm. area. Mm -hmm. So, but of course, those are undisturbed for, you know, many, many, yeah. many years. Right. And there's just uh, grape plants there. Very interesting. 10 to 1. So, so really, the, the, the system ought to be that you grow, grow your plant. If it's a good plant, you test it at, with a microbiometer. If it's a good plant, you check that fungal bacteria ratio and you keep an eye on that fungal bacteria ratio until you figure out for your soils in your situation with your plant's genetics, what's the best. Yeah. And that's the beauty of the microbiometer. You can figure it out yourself, you know, and you don't have to send it in, wait 48 hours to get a result. You do it right there, right in the field, and you get the answer in 10 minutes. And then it's in the system, it's being stored, uh, and you go back and look at it two years later if you want. You don't know. So that's the beauty of, of the addition of the fungal bacteria ratio. It's just like the pH. I mean, you know, we really should treat it the same way as pH. You look Jeez, at man. it, and you can determine what makes sense. You that know that God. certain plants need a low pH, certain need a higher pH. That's absolutely true. Now that we can measure it, you can, you can tell what it is. And, and that's the thing. I mean, people... Growers are, uh, cannabis growers are not used to the concept of being able to measure these things in the field in 10 minutes for $5. And so they don't do it. <laughs> this microbiometer lets you do that. I love how stoked you are and, and how passionate you are about, about this mission. And honestly, it's, it's a pleasure to help. I do want to drill down on one thing you said there, though. And this is going into the kind of cannabis cultivation side a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, you said what works for your genetics and all these cultivars act so wildly differently. It's almost like they act like a totally different plant sometimes. That's another reason why it's good to find a cultivar you like and hang on to it, is it not? You get to learn these cultivars. Let's say you do find that ratio just right. The medicine is, is just what you've been looking for. Like, I love popping new seeds and doing new stuff all the time. But Jeff, do you feel just kind of, again, pointing towards cultivation, in order to like really master a plant, you usually have to spend some time with the genetics and and learn its nuances and intricacies. Do you agree or, or, or feel free to push back? I know you're yeah, an auto grower, I, I, so you can't take cuttings and just hold on to them forever. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I don't like the cuttings anyway. I don't like clones. Uh, and I understand why people do it. But the thing about clones is they don't have quite the same bacteria makeup, I don't think, as, you know, mm. as, as the, the, the seeds which hold them on. But yeah, you 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 got to you have to study your plants. So you understand it's just like anything else. And, you know, you grow uh, dahlias or whatever. You know, you you get to learn which ones you like, which ones do the best in your area, et cetera, et cetera. It's too easy to just to, you know you pick up a book by you know by Ed Rosenthal or, or Jorge Cervantes, and you know it says do this, do that. You know, but it doesn't say do it with this seed or that seed, or you know because Everybody understands you've got to develop your own. Yeah, that's true. I, well, I think a lot of people set themselves up for failure, like I said, with the polycropping. Because if you're just popping all these fire seeds or you know, people sending you free testers or whatever, it's like sometimes you can set yourself up for failure because they can't all be so different. I guess that's just the kind of thought that I was having. That's right. That's right. Now, now the one area where, where again, I think you got to pay particular attention is in the autoflower area because the, the, the genetics are getting better and better and better and it's better. And, and, you know, so... It, if you're using an autoflower seed that's 10 years old, you're not getting the advantage of the advances that have been made. <laughs> yeah, so, that's true. Uh, and, I, and I can kick myself. I just yesterday, <laughs> on my, I found the autoflower seeds I was supposed to be sending to Judy. <laughs> so that's why you didn't get them, Judy. I, I found them. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love Next it. Next year. Yeah, absolutely. Next we'll year. do a, We'll do a huge run. So listen, I know we have a hard out in uh, just a few minutes here. I think we can squeeze in one more little question that, I, that I'd like to ask you both about, you know, when we talk about cannabis growers, there's so much focus on bacteria and fungus. But when you take a look at other forms of microbiology, I feel like they get less play, but you've brought them up a couple different times. Like for instance, protozoa is another microbe that, 
that comes up a lot when I deal with like the regenerative agriculture guests, but it's not really on growers radar. A lot of growers understand add this beneficial bacteria product. It's called fish shit. Add this myco. It's a beneficial fungi. But if you talk to your average like home grower about protozoa, they won't know what you're talking about. Do you want to speak on that a little bit? Well, I mean, the, the soil food web isn't just bacteria and fungi. Uh, obviously, we have the nematodes and the protozoa, which are the recyclers of the fertilizer bags, which are the bacteria and the fungi. But you've got, you've got all manner of stuff, algae. You've got you know, microarthropods that are, that are dealing with the microbes. There's any number of, of different kinds of microbes in there that, that you, you need to have in your system. It's, a, it's called living soil, not because it's just got these two microbes in it. It's because it's got the whole range of stuff. And they, and they keep each other in check. They kill off enemies of one versus the other. You know, I mean, they, they operate based upon how the plant deals with them. And they're all important. You can't just grow stuff with just bacteria and just fungi. It's, it's just funny because there's not any like products facing growers that are like, you know, protozoa boost or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Well, yeah, there is. There are actually. There are. But they use it for different kinds of things. And, and I think what, what I'm finding is that a lot of these things have been designed for big agriculture and have been trickled down to gardening and yardening oh, and, and, and grow and cannabis. Sure. But it's getting there. I mean, we, we use rhizobia bacteria. There are now other kinds of bacteria that are coming to the market that people can buy. In the next five or 10 years, there'll be a whole shelf full of microbes wow. that you'll be able to pick up. Fucking love Before it. Before I started writing this teaming with bacteria, in fact, uh, I was actually working on teaming with nematodes because they're incredibly important. Oh, that's cool. Um, but the bacteria, the bacteria just took my breath away. <laughs> super, super cool. Well, you know, one of the things that, you know, I'm, I'm working on the soil food web here at every level. I mean, the base of the soil food web are the fungi and the bacteria. And when you get up to the next level, it's a 1,000-fold decrease mm. because they feed on the base, which is the fungi and the bacteria. Mm -hmm. So each time you go up in the food web, you're getting fewer and fewer of them. And that's why the base, the microbial biomass, is so important because it's the source of the food for all these other critters that live in the soil. Everything else. Yeah. So if you increase your biomass, you're increasing not just the bacteria and the fungi, you're increasing these other critters that eat the bacteria and fungi. Right. And that's, right. that's what we're after. Okay. So here's the thing. We've got, uh, we've got a heart out here in just a couple minutes. We've got to wrap it up, but can we tease some more content? I would love to, first of all, we have to keep up to date on on your tests using, using this device and all the things you do, we would love to know what you found guarantees to increase the, the biomass, what guarantees to decrease it. Maybe we can do a Growcast TV or a, some sort of live web Zoom thing where you can walk me through a test. Are you guys open to that? I just I love what you're doing um, inside and outside of cannabis, and Growcast is really here to, to support you, and we'd love to have you back. Oh, we'd be happy to do that. I know, Jeff, you're harder to nail down, but anytime you have time, you are welcome back on the Growcast podcast. If Judy's available, I never miss an opportunity <laughs> to talk with Judy. So I love that. It's always fun. I mean, and I, I don't think people understand that she's got a, a degree in, uh, that enables her to really drill down into this stuff in a way that most of us can't. So, you know, it's really it's just a delight. I know we, we had her on solo for the, for, uh, you know, it's two weeks ago as this airs and it, I totally see what you're saying. It's awesome that you're so impressed and infatuated uh, with Judy because having her as a guest, it's, you, you're both incredible. You're go, you're both a fountain of knowledge and we, we really thank you here at, uh, at Growcast. Let's play the standing ovation for you. <laughs> yeah. I'm <laughs> yeah, thinking we should one. do something like click and clack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> click and clack car talk oh my god I that's like too it. good <laughs> yeah that's it's too just good. fungi and bacteria <laughs> yeah. amazing you know. absolutely amazing uh microbiometer.com code growcast 15 percent off the teaming series by the great jeff lowenfels grab a teaming with microbes for just five bucks when you purchase your microbiometer again use that savings and uh, i think that we're gonna tease here as well maybe some signed copies being given away to members couple of those so stay tuned for that everybody and again if you want to get on in on that growcast uh, tv you know jeff is going to be up there we'll, we'll be doing a video thing live and members can ask questions 
So you know what to do, everybody. Growcastpodcast.com slash membership. Just 10 bucks a month. One more time, Judith, Jeff, thank you so much. Seriously, appreciate you. A pleasure. Thank you. Great. Thank you. We enjoyed it. All right, everybody. We'll see you next time. This is Jeff Lowenfelds, Dr. Judith, Fitz, Judith Fitzpatrick, and Jordan River all signing off. Saying be safe out there, everybody, and grow smarter. That's our show for today, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Before we wrap it up, got to give some shout outs at the end of the show here. AC Infinity, the one stop shop for growing. That's, I mean, they used to just sell fans, everybody. Use GrowCast15, that's the code, for 15% off. And remember to send us a snapshot of you using any of our codes to win free seats each and every month. AC Infinity, I just put up my new AC Infinity 10. It is so nice. Those thicker poles make a huge difference. If you are tired of your crummy old tent, if you need to spruce up your, your grow space, make it look sexy again, grab yourself some new AC Infinity pots, grab yourself an AC Infinity tent, definitely upgrade those fans if you haven't done it yet, and your grow tent will be fresh and new and sleek looking, baby. It's like a whole new experience. Like I said, as soon as I put together the bottom frame, I noticed those thicker poles were, were a total game changer. I am loving the uh, the AC Infinity Cloud Lab series. I got the 4x4. I'm looking at it right now. Very, very good tents. I'm very impressed with these products. And don't forget the Ion Grid lights are now available. Growcast 15 15% off. Use that Growcast code. We appreciate it, everybody. And send us a snapshot. However you can get it to us. Make sure to check out membership as always. Stay tuned. Get on the green list so you know when we're coming to a town near you. We got Oklahoma coming up, everybody. That's right. Oklahoma in January. Big, big news. You want to stay tuned and get the dates as soon as possible? Possible? As soon as possible? Go to growcastpodcast.com forward slash the list. Get on the green list for free. Stay up to date on everything. That's all for now. Thank you all so much for listening. I appreciate you. And I hope you're doing amazing things inside your garden. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.